Um, in the online setting, it's different because as you know, um, it's asynchronous. So we have kids that sometimes work at night and they have jobs or doing all kinds of things. So we typically set up a reoccurring appointment and I just say, whatever time works for you, let's do that. So we set it up. I set up a Google appointment, just like you guys received to get this um, meeting. Um, I set it up reoccurring and I typically set up reminders too. So I'll set up an email reminder. I'll set up a reminder so it dings and tells them when to jump online. Um, a lot of the times with special education, you really have to follow through with things and set up, you know, um, calling them. This is really important. If they don't show, we call. Um, during that time, the nice thing about Google Hangouts is, number one, it's free. <laughs> and um, it's pretty reliable. So we typically will um, get online. The nice thing, I can share my screen. They can share their screen. Um, we typically integrate um, what they're working on in their courses to align with their IEP goals. So um, working on essays, working on reading content area, those kinds of things. Um, and we uh, work with them typically an hour a week, sometimes for students more. I would say on average, it's about an hour a week. Some students less, depending on their need. Um, and we um, go ahead and just work on all those things there. Uh, make sure that they have their accommodations. We do a lot of our transition stuff during that time as well. Um, teaching them self-advocacy, encouraging them to reach out to their two students or their teachers on their own. Um, um, talking about, you know, careers and goals and all of the, that kind of stuff. And then as far as testing, Tammy, did you get to testing? Yeah, I did a little bit. Um, okay. It's I, and I did say that's going to be a little different for us right now until we can actually get back out there. So, if you listen to the stuff, the and I'll be talking about this in our SPED meeting next time. But um, there'll be some changes that we're going to have to work through until we can actually meet back face to face with our students again to get these assessments completed. Right. And then the one thing I was I started to talk about when I realized that my microphone was working. <laughs> was as far as accommodations, that's another area that as case managers, we do a lot of, um, we make sure that the teachers have a copy of the accommodations and we actually have a little blip that we send them because we're on the quarter system, it's a little more difficult. Um, the teachers, and, and it's online, is that the teachers don't get to know the students like they would if they were sitting in their classroom, you know, in English or math or science or whatever it is. So we always make sure that we have some very descriptive this student struggles in this area this is difficult for this student things that are kind of between the lines that you wouldn't see necessarily in the written iep but this just descriptive and we work a lot this i think would be appropriate for this student in your classroom or in this course this is going to be difficult for them um, encourage them to do alternative assignments or just any of those things that would you know that we take for granted in, an, in a brick and mortar school where they're you know they're sitting there right there um, a lot of times we have kids, you know, with autism that have um, different areas that might be difficult for them. Um, ADHD is a big one. Those kids that have a hard time sitting down and, and working constantly, making sure that the teachers realize, you know, if there's a kid in your class and he's just staring at the wall, you can see that. But in an online school, you have to pay attention to other, um, other factors that, so you understand what's going on. And we work a lot with our gen ed teachers the students really struggling in this area, what can we do? Um, those kinds of things. Do you guys have any questions? So I do see we've got one hand raised. Oh, it just went away. Um, there was a hand raised from somebody who said Boise School District. If you still have your question, go ahead and um, you can put it out in the chat. Or if you raise your hand again, well, there it is. I will unmute you and go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, hi, this is Tracy Carlson from Boise School District. On the one-to-one um, -one services, do you meet for math a certain amount of time and then reading or just um, depending on what their need is throughout their IEP? Are you setting certain times for certain subjects, certain areas? Um, yes and no. So typically we have general service time where we meet with them and we'll work on their IEP goals. Now I teach, um, I teach an essentials math class and I teach an essentials science class. And so in addition to that, I have online, I have office hours where the students are encouraged. They don't always come. <laughs> They're encouraged to come and get support in those specific areas in addition to the one-on-one -on -one time. So they'll get that dedicated. This is what we're doing this week in math. 
and they'll get the support that they need in that. The other thing that I didn't point out is um, because we use Google, we have the Google chat too. So students that are struggling, they can message me and get an instant message. They'll be like, hey Gail, I'm really struggling in this math problem. I don't understand it. Do you have some time to catch up with me? And it's just like them coming to your desk or raising their hand and I'll say, yeah, I, I am with another student right now, but I can see you in an hour or I can see you tomorrow morning or whatever I have time. The nice then, thing about that is, what's that? Well, and then what do you do when they don't show up or they're not participating or um, you're not able question. to reach their IEP goals? That's a good question because that is a huge problem in online school and I've been doing this for about 16 years, uh, 17 years, <laughs> long time. Um, you follow up and you document it. So um, if they don't show up, there's usually a text or a phone call or a message, hey, where are you? And we typically will reschedule that time. You didn't show up for this time, so we need to catch up on Friday. And, and, and the, th the reality of it is, it's just like in a brick and mortar school, if they come or they don't show up or they don't engage, I mean, you do everything you can to engage them. And if they choose not to, that's their choice. But there is always a follow up with, you missed your session, you need to catch up with me on Friday at this time, or when's another time that we can meet? Um, there's always an effort, to, we, and it's all documented, and, um, and then we make that effort. And if they choose not to, they, they simply choose not to. That's their choice. Generally, when they don't show up, they tend to not complete assignments as well. And so Clayton can probably talk a little bit about how we kind of work with attendance on that. Well, I would only mention that if someone was asking me, I was, I was thinking mainly special ed stuff. Well, and I think this is, this is my understanding. This is kind of my experience with all of this is, um, is really building relationships. And you might think that that's a difficult thing to do online, but it's actually not. And that's typically one of the things that we do the first week is, I'll spend that first few minutes when I call them on the phone or when I talk to them, what are you interested in? And, and make them, you know, if that time that they're coming to me is valuable for them and their grades are helping, that's the reason they're going to come back. And um, so we spend a lot of time really building those relationships with students and with the families. And we get a lot of support from parents going, hey, you need to be there. And, you know, we're dealing with teenagers. so. Um, getting the support of parents to make them come is important as well. All right, thank you. So we're going to, and just to, so everybody's aware, I started the recording a little bit late. Um, so we missed that first part that I did kind of showing our content. So I'll do that again at the end, just so everybody has that on the recording who didn't get to see it um, right at the beginning. But we're gonna move now into our question answer period. And I wanna introduce kind of everybody who maybe you haven't heard from yet and I uh, kind of appreciate all the hosts for being here, everybody for being in this meeting. Um, we're up to 145 participants, 146, which is way more than I was expecting. So thank you all for being here. I'm just going to go down the list here of the co-hosts as they're listed in um, the Zoom participants list. So we've got Clayton from iSucceed Virtual. We've got Charlie from the SDE, Jolene from IDLA, Katie from iSucceed, Mont, who is with IDLA, Rebecca Willis with IDLA, Tammy with I Succeed and Gayla Jones, who I may make you a co-host now that you jumped back in, are all here to um, kind of help as best we can um, and provide any support, suggestions, ideas, and in general for you guys as the audience here to also jump in with suggestions, thoughts, ideas. So if you've got a question you'd like to hear somebody answer or discuss, please put it down there in the chat or raise your hand and we'll get you unmuted so you can ask that. While we're waiting for the first couple of questions, um, I will um, point out in the chat, Katie added two great uh, points in there, um, things that they do. So you can see, uh, actually three there, if you scroll up a little bit, um, about tracking communications. Using your Google Apps is a huge, if you've got Google Apps for education, or if you've got the Microsoft Teams apps, you can actually have all those logged, recorded, and archived, so you have a history of anything that was kind of said in those sessions or you want to um, look back at emails that have been archived or chats or anything like that. So that's a great tool and suggestion 
also using Adobe Sign to actually make sure the IPs are signed. Those are um, sh should be fully legal to have signed um, that way. And then down below, you can see um, that last point that she made there. So I saw a hand come up and then it went away. So again, if you do have a question, go ahead and raise the hand and we will get you unmuted. So I'm gonna go ahead and unmute the first. So go ahead, Jocelyn. So I wasn't able to add anything to chat because it says I'm disabled. So um, my I joined late. Is this being recorded so that we could watch it later? And will you share the link? Yes, yeah, so it will be it is being recorded right now. Um, again, I, I started the recording a little bit late. So I'm going to redo my part at the beginning right at the end. So those who um, didn't get that will get it. So definitely being recorded and I just fixed the chat. So everybody can chat now if they have um, something they want to throw in there. All right, Boise, I unmuted you again. Hi, this is Tracy Carlson again. Uh, so on the elementary students that we're, we might be providing online instruction to, um, what do those minutes look like typically for virtual online? What, you know, 30 to 45 minutes brick and mortar, but what does that correlate to in the virtual online world? Gail, do you want to talk to that? that that's actually a good question. We are a high school. But I can answer that because I, I have done elementary online as well. Okay. Um, and, and typically, obviously an hour long for an elementary student is a little bit longer. So depending on the age level, it's usually around 30 minutes. Um, once a week or every day? Yeah, once a okay. week. And what you may do, what, what I've done in the past with elementary students is break it up and meet twice a week. So I might do 30 minutes on Tuesday and 30 minutes on Thursday or 30 minutes on Monday and Wednesday or whatever it is. And then um, provide, and it looks a little different in elementary just because you're working on specific goals, I think more in elementary and in high school, you're kind of more integrating those goals into the courses because we've, they're earning credits now. So you're kind of, kind of integrating all of that. So um, with elementary, I, in the past, I've used all kinds of like the Google apps and we read books online and we do the, all those kinds of things. Uh, we might do worksheets online. We might have a lot of interaction, those kinds of things um, in place of that. But I would, I would definitely split it up. That's a long time, an hour for an elementary student, a long time. All right, we have some questions in the chat. So I'll go ahead and get to those. So the first one I see there is IDLA courses need supports for students with disabilities when used in the school setting. Students need to need support usually with small group or one on one to complete. So yes, if, if the support that the student needs is one on one or small group, um, our content won't necessarily solve that issue. Um, if the students need supports like an extended time or screen readers or adaptations, um, colors, things like that, all those accessibility features we have in there. Um, it doesn't solve the need for a, a person that may be able to need to help live, um, but there are some modifications you can do with that, including um, spinning up Google Meets to do one-on-ones to help the student through, especially if you've got paraprofessionals that are untasked at this time, that may usually be the ones providing those supports. You could have them do live Meets or Teams um, with, or Zoom even, uh, to talk to those students, um, work with them, do screen sharing, kind of provide those one-on-one -on -one group supports. And then from our panelists here, does anybody have anything to add to that? Hey, Will, this is Jolene. I would just add that I've noticed it really helps students if you show them the tools that they can use to help themselves, they won't always find those intuitively. So if a student is not reading on grade level and needs a screen reader for that reason, and showing them how to use that or showing them about the alternate activities if they need uh, like a questions chunked, maybe they need to see the question one at a time instead of on a large screen. They won't always find those things on themselves. So some of it could be training them in the tools that are there so that they could be a little bit more independent later. This is Gail. I would add to that. One of the things that we do is um, We'll show them those tools. We'll make a quick video and we'll post that video for them. We can send it out through the chat. We post it in our announcements. Um, I might email them the video um, and then they kind of have it in their little repertoire. Um, and then if we meet them online, I can show them that way too. 
but it's nice to just be able to post that video like screen reader and they're like, oh yeah, let me try that and they can watch the video. And Boise, your hand was still raised. I'm not sure if that was from the last question or if you wanted to add here. Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. All right. So next question we have, how are online schools servicing behavioral, social, emotional, adaptive minutes? Okay, this is Gail. I'll take this one. So um, this is actually a large portion of, of our population in the online school is kids that just are struggling in um, brick and mortar school in a classroom setting with your peers. So um, one of the things that you'll find is that a lot of the things that um, are triggers for these students are gone in an online setting, right? The peers aren't there, the distractions aren't there. Um, so we find that those behaviors are minimized. But when we do have behaviors, typically um, building that relationship with that student, um, making those accommodations that make that student feel comfortable in their home, comfortable in the things that they do, reaching out. Um, I have I have some students that are, you know, emotion. Um, emotionally disturbed that call me on a regular basis. I call them, I text them. Are you okay today? What's going on? What can I help you with? Um, so just having that contact with them like you would in a brick and mortar school, but it's done through messaging or text and or um, emails or whatever it is on a regular basis. Um, but typically we don't see a lot of the same kinds of behaviors that you would in a brick and mortar setting, which is kind of nice. Any questions on that? I will jump us into the next one. So would you recommend classroom teachers share their Google Classroom admin roles with resource teachers so that they can see the assignments and supports where necessary? Um, just my own advice or recommendation on that is I would, I would make them a co-teacher of the Google Classroom. Um, you do have some potential FERPA concerns that you would want to maybe address with your district admin, um, or if you're the admin to think about, because by making them a co-host of that Google Classroom, they are going to be able to see the other students work in the class. Mm -hmm. And if you're using Google Classroom to grade, which I don't know how many schools are actually using the grading portion because it doesn't interact with CISs very well. But if you're using that Google Classroom portion to grade, they're going to be able to see other students grades. And so um, I could see making an argument that when they help out in the gen classroom, they're seeing that also, but I could see making the opposite argument. So I would get clearance from your admin or do at least some discussion, but it's the only way they'll really be able to see the students work and work with uh, work directly with them. An alternative to doing that in Google Classroom would be to make them the student's parent or guardian in Google Classroom. So you have the ability to invite a parent or guardian to a student in Google Classroom. And when you do that, it restricts their view down to just the work that student's doing. They're not going to see all the posts and announcements in the class and maybe everything that they would see as a co-teacher that they may need to see, but it would at least restrict their view down to just those just the students they're serving and i'll open that up if anybody else has a thought on that all right next question Bill, this is clayton i was going to answer that if they're when, when you're doing the one-on-one -on -one support if the student is screen sharing you are going to see their screen and you're going to see everything that they see and then that avoids the FERPA problems because then you're not seeing anything that anyone else of anyone else is just theirs and then Boise you wanted to add uh hi this is Tracy again um I asked the same question yesterday in a um webinar with the state because my concern was the confidentiality piece for students um parents and students seeing other um, special ed students in the Google Classroom. But from what I took away from the answer to that, and I believe they have it in writing, is that um, we're not producing an educational record. And so it's not breaking the confidentiality piece. Um, but I'm waiting for the, the written portion to come out, but that should be um, distributed to all of us soon. Thank you. And Charlie, did you have anything Will? you wanted to add on that? Yeah. Yeah. Will, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Tracy, nice job. Uh, 
Um, I'm glad you were participated yesterday and your takeaway was spot on. Uh, Thanks, Charlie. And as we uh -huh. And as we discussed yesterday in the webinar, and I believe Elaine even gave the example of, uh, you know, when uh, a, a person comes in and observes uh, a classroom. Um, so you are correct, and yes, we are going to have that written response um, probably by tomorrow, um, and we will share that, um, you know, the, the most recent Q&A when we um, uh, have our next webinar. And, and that's about it, Will. I mean, we covered it yesterday, and we'll, again, put it in, in writing here in the next day or so. Perfect. Um, so the next question I'm going to answer in the chat. So the question was, how will this work for students who do not have internet service at home and parents are not home? I'm going to answer, excuse me, part of that in the chat. I'm going to throw into the chat here in just a minute um, some links to both some free internet offerings for students and some low cost internet offerings for students and families. That doesn't 100% answer your question, but if you do have students who don't have internet service, um, but could get it where they're located, there are some free offerings. Of course, some students just can't, can't get it where, they're, where they live. Um, that's a different problem. But then to the other part of the question, um, I will, of course, open it up to the group to answer, but there's also the thought, and I, I think Charlie said this a couple of times on the webinar yesterday, um, that you might need to think of alternative flexible options like homework packets, whether those are mailed or picked up and things of that nature, but I will open it up to the group. This is Katie from I Succeed. I just wanted to say one thing on this, and I think this is pretty much the million dollar question, I think, not only for SCAD, but for the traditional schools looking at this. And just... I, I would just add, there's gonna be a lot of ideas on how to reach out to kids and there's gonna be a lot of outreach depending on your district and communicate uh, and your community on what they can assist with. But I think really philosophically looking at this time period where hopefully, fingers crossed, this is a short period of time, um, that philosophically looking at this is more that, you know, doing the best you can, um, maybe focusing more on if you've got some limitations with the student or you know that instructionally they're just not going to get as much as they normally would, is looking at this more of a communication, outreach, um, social, emotional kind of connection with the kids. It may be that maybe a phone call is all you're going to get with this kid. Maybe they're going to get a packet in the mail, but it's going to be pretty limited. But I think as long as everyone is doing their best effort and their best outreach, I think that's a, a good place to start. Moving from traditional to online and doing that with quality is a really, really heavy lift. And I don't know that anyone's expecting it to be perfect, but I think everyone's just trying to, to do it the best they can with the guidelines. And I, I really appreciate everybody in this <laughs> webinar and all of us coming together to have this discussion because it's definitely not an easy thing. But I think that um, during this time period, the more contact you have a kid, multiple communications, uh, just in general, it's gonna be really helpful. And Charlie, do you have anything you wanted to add maybe from your discussion yesterday about supporting those students without internet? Put Charlie on the spot here. You may be Sorry, muted, Charlie. Uh, Will, will you restate? Yeah, I'm sorry. Will, will you restate the question? Yeah, the question was about supporting students who don't have internet at home. What, what you could do alternatively to get them assignments or work with them. Sure. Yeah, and I think, um, as you mentioned, uh, Will, um, and you are uh, correct uh, in that, you know, this is the time for flexibility and creativity. And um, even through some of OSEP's guidance, they've given some examples of what that might look like. The ones we keep coming back to are sending packets home, potentially doing something over the phone. Um, you know, it, it's just really being creative. I do know and I have heard that some schools, and I'm, and Will, you know this, I am the least techie person, um, but that some schools now you can have internet access in the parking lot of, of schools. Um, I don't know if that's widespread, how that exactly works, but um, I think there's um, been some things that have happened in that regard that may be uh, depending on your community, uh, might be able to help out in terms of just having that access. But otherwise, I just would really remind um, all the 
um, teachers, related service personnel, you guys are the experts. You know your students. You know what they can benefit from. And um, it's okay to think outside of the box. Thank you. Um, that's it. Thank you. Um, so the next question, as a gen ed teacher, will we meet the needs by office hours and they log in or do we schedule a one-on-one -on -one time with them? I'm a middle school teacher. I'll let anybody kind of grab that that wants to. This is Clayton at our school. Our gen ed teachers don't meet with students one-on-one -on -one like, like the service like the caseworker does, but we do a massive amount of our instruction in what we call in, uh, impromptu online meetings through Google Hangouts. So Google Hangouts is like a chat service, but when, when it becomes evident that you really need to see a kid's screen and really need to work one-on-one -on -one with them, you have that. And generally the way that would work is, is you know, you could reach out to a student through chat, they could reach out to you through chat, and then if you need to work with them that way. So for a, a special ed student, the gen ed teacher doesn't necessarily have this hour a week that they set aside for their student. That is what the caseworker does. But the gen ed teacher could be available if they needed to be available. And the caseworker often facilitates that communication between the special ed student and the gen ed teacher. Like, hey, why don't you reach out to Mrs. So-and-so? They're green right now. It looks like they're online and then that could happen. That's how we do it in our school anyway. And all of our gen ed teachers have live classroom time that's on their calendars so that students can reach out to them during that time as well. All right, next one was a comment um, about that that's how Inspire does it as well. Um, once a week with 30, 45 minutes and a case manager um, that works with gen ed teachers. Um, next one, can you elaborate on how you would do worksheets online? So there's, uh, depends on what they mean by worksheets exactly. So you could, there's a couple of different technical mm -hmm. options I can think of. So you can scan you know, a worksheet into a PDF and deliver that to the students. You can make it a PDF that could be filled out um, once you've scanned it in, um, you could recreate the worksheet in things like Google Forms where it could be auto graded using Google Classroom or um, students could go in and fill it out. So there's a couple of different ways you could convert your worksheets to be usable online. Um, if that's the question, if the question is more how you could work with a special education student online doing a worksheet, again, you could do one on ones, you could do screen shares. Um, do meets where you bring them together and discuss, even call them on the phone and kind of work through the worksheet together. And then does anybody else have some suggestions on that? Uh, well, this is Katie. I just put a um, link to a resource just if uh, anybody was interested and they had a Google Doc they wanted to convert to a form, I just said, put in a YouTube link on how to do that. Oh, perfect. I want to do a quick mic check for Rebecca. Rebecca, are you able to speak? Can you hear me? We can, Rebecca. Awesome. I was trying to get through to Will on the um, the last question in regard, or two questions ago in regards to students without internet access. Um, I'm also the special education director for Wendell School District and the majority of our kids do not have internet access. And so one of the things that I have suggested to our special education teachers is to um, get comfortable on the phone, um, doing a lot of phone calls and actually doing assignments verbally, which a lot of our special education students, a lot of times a verbal answer is much easier for them. Um, so I've, I've really asked our special education teachers to work with our general education teachers to figure out the best curriculum for them to accommodate. And then it might be using our parents or special ed teachers to have those phone conversations to complete some of those assignments. I know that works because as an IDLA teacher, um, I was um, with a specific school and a lot of the students weren't completing the assignments. So 
So I would just set it up on a weekly basis where I would call in and I would spend probably 20 to 30 minutes with each student individually going over the, the assignments. And if the assignments, um, if I came to a question or something that they didn't understand, I would just rephrase it or really pick out the key ideas for the students and get them to expand on the answer. Um, and that worked very, very well for, for those kids um, that I worked with with IDLA. And again, I'm gonna apologize my voice. I've, I've lost it the last couple of days. So sorry, I hope you can hear me. So. We can, came through loud and clear, thank you. Um, the next question is, what is the site to rewatch this? So I just pulled it up on the screen share here and I'm dropping it into the chat as a link. Oops. Sorry, that went just to Rebecca. Let me drop it in for everybody. Chat in the link. So all of our webinars that we are doing, we are archiving right here on our eDay support page, which I just put over there in the chat. And you can see, for example, we have three web uh, archives down here right now. Um, this archive will get added right to this list along with several of the other ones that we've got coming up over the coming days. So it'll all be dropped in right there. Um, next one, what kind of training do special ed teachers get on the technology supports? I'm not sure my teachers would know how to find those types of tech supports for students uh, you're talking about. So there's a couple of different options and Charlie and everybody else might have some more. But the Idaho School for the Deaf and the Blind I know does some trainings and supports that they can help depending on, of course, the student's needs. Um, when I worked in Mountain Home um, as the technology director there, we provided training to our SPED teachers on how they could use various supports or we brought in experts in those supports um, and then I'll open it up for anybody to say how they train their special education teachers on using technology. Um, it, uh, sorry, well, this is Charlie again. Yes, um, IESDB is a, a resource uh, that I mentioned yesterday, but also don't forget that you have the assistive technology um, project and those folks are willing and ready to assist any way they can. In addition to that, um, we have SESTA. So that's another excellent resources. And all of the resources that I've mentioned uh, are statewide. So they are available to the entire state. And then, uh, you know, for those districts, maybe larger districts, of course, working closely with your IT folks and experts within your district. Uh, but, you know, AT Project, IESDB, SESTA, uh, those are some really good resources as well. And this is Jolene, and the other two webinars that Will was showing there do include training. So if you wanted your teachers to attend training for how to use Google Classroom or how to use Google Hangouts, those are both included in those webinars. So if the teachers need that, it's not a special education focus, but it is tool focused. So if the teachers need to know how to use those two free tools, um, they can find it there at those webinars. And I succeed. I'll I'll talk for you guys real quick. Also did several webinars and you can find those um, on the, the governor's um, coronavirus response page for education where a lot of Charlie's links are, our links are. Um, I believe I succeeds um, videos are on there too and they may be other places if you guys want to jump in. I went and linked some of our content in the last couple slides of that uh, how to do special education presentation. So that's all there too. And awesome. it's got links. Awesome. Thank you. Um, next question um, may be out of date at this point, but I'll ask anyways. And it was, Charlie, could you please weigh in on using Google Classroom with special education students? Uh, um, again, um, we covered this yesterday in the webinar, and um, we will get the written answer out to everyone. Um, but as, and I believe it was Elaine that um, took the question yesterday, she referenced everyone to the FERPA um, guidance document. But really, um, as Tracy mentioned uh, in her response, um, you know, it's, it's, really not a FERPA issue because um, it's no different than um, the example given if somebody comes in and does an observation in a brick and mortar setting. But go back, listen to the webinar, we'll have the written response uh, out. Um, now that this is the second time the question came up, uh, we'll make sure and get it out by tomorrow. 
Awesome, thank you. Next one is please tell Will his screen is blurry. Um, so I hope it's not blurry for everyone. Sorry if it is, I'm just doing the traditional screen share. So I hope it's coming through. Um, if not, again, this will be archived and it should be um, recorded a little more clearly. I'm going to find the next question. Um, the next one was please contact us and we can oh, connect you with, so if you contact, they can connect you with DHH and DVI students. Next one is what is the recommendation for students who are nonverbal, severe and profound to meet their goals? And I will leave that up to the group um, on how those students could be supported either face to face in small groups or online. Nobody wants to jump in with that one. <laughs> um, I will throw out what I would have thought about when I was a building principal. Um, Charlie, definitely jump in with anything I'm saying wrong here. Um, but as a building principal, um, what I would have been looking at right now um, would have been the possibility of bringing the severe and profound students in, in very small groups, maintaining social distancing um, the best you could. Obviously, some students need very direct contact um, but um, keeping track of, you know, no more than 10 students in an area or 10 students plus adults total in an area. So it might be, you know, five students and three adults or whatever the, the thing is. And I would have looked at potentially busing those students in and, and holding a more traditional school with my severe and profound students, just because I don't think there is a way to do it online um, with some of those students uh, to provide the supports they need. So that's what I would have been considering. Um, I don't know that it's the correct answer, but that's what I would have done. Or, yeah. uh, well, this is Charlie. For those students who have significant disabilities, um, it, it is a challenge. Um, but I think that the focus really should be, well, I don't think, the focus for students who have significant disabilities um, really needs to be focused on their health and safety. Those are probably the most vulnerable students that we have um, as it relates to this pandemic. So I would be very, very cautious uh, in how you provide education just because you don't want to inadvertently put um, a child who with significant disabilities that is already at risk um, in any further, um, you know, we don't want to put them in harm's way. That doesn't answer the question about online. Online, and it's case by case. Um, I'm trying to think of when that might be appropriate, and quite honestly, I can't think of a time um, in all my years in special education where a student with significant disabilities could benefit from online. Um, but, you know, it's case by case. I think uh, this is when you do have to get creative. And maybe packets really aren't even really appropriate. Um, it may be one of those situations, again, case by case, that uh, when all of this is, um, when we have moved past this, um, where you really have to look at that compensatory services uh, down, down the road. Hopefully that helps. If I can jump in for just half a sec, hopefully you can hear me. This is Julian down at Bonneville School District. What we're doing for those kiddos is uh, instructing our teachers to do, right now it's a mix of individualized sort of um, uh, pre-recorded or live um, Google Classroom uh, lessons, uh, some packetized instruction and then we're also instituting for people that have AIDS, uh, uh, call a BI, call a BCBA, call a social worker. So we're putting our, our people that normally would be in a consultative status providing parents the ability to call those folks to have um, some uh, direct contact if they have emergencies at home where they need some help. And then, like Charlie said, we've already started to budget the fact that we don't see any way when this is over to avoid um, potentially a multiple month uh, summer school of some sort. Well, this is Charlie again. Uh, as I'm watching the chat box, there's some really good suggestions that are uh, coming in. The one I uh, really like is the idea of the videos. Um, providing the videos and um, of how they would do things if 
they were in the brick and mortar. Um, so um, this is a great uh, example of how folks in the field uh, truly are the experts and, and they um, you know, know their students and know how to best meet their needs. So kudos to everybody out there giving the great suggestions. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. That's what we were hoping to get out of this was a lot of community sharing. So great advice from everybody. Jonathan, I just unmuted you because you had your hand raised if you wanted to add. Oh, hello. Um, right now, I am trying to take what were on PDF files from like Common Core Worksheets. I think it's just Common Core Sheets um, dot com. And I am taking them and putting them into Google Docs using tables. So like one side of the tables, I might have the questions, then I might put tables right next to them with the um, with answer boxes so that um, they can edit their answer boxes and fill in um, the correct answers. And then they can just share that with me um, via Google Docs and doing it with the um, boxes like I'm doing makes it to where they can do everything with a cell phone or a smartphone and um, just share it right back with me. I'm also using a uh, website of my own for uh, showing videos on how to do the math that they fill into each box. I also wanna say for kids with disabilities, um, with severe, one thing I am trying to do myself, it won't be done immediately, but I'm trying to um, do a drag and drop um, video game programming to where they can do a very simple click on a box that might say a word to them so and they can link the word up with a picture. Um, when I get that figured out, I can share it with people. That would be it's great, a, Jonathan. It's using the uh, Game Maker language, which is a very simple video game programming language, which I think during the summer I might um, continue on my web page um, having tutorials on how to make those because I have a lot of kids that are really excited about um, doing the video game programming right now. Awesome, thank you. Rob, I, Rod, I just unmuted you if you wanted to share. Uh, thank you very much. My, my note is not so much uh, based on curriculum. It's a note of, of gratitude. I know that we have, oh, what, we have 130 some odd people on this, on this uh, Zoom. I just wanted to point out and uh, point out that we have a listserv in at least our, our fourth, fifth, and sixth districts that uh, have been very valuable for me as a uh, special ed director because I wear many hats in my, my little rural school district. Just a couple notes there I'd like to point out. Um, Kendall Mason, we have Cliff Hart, we have all of our folks that are sharing information that um, would just say we are you know, that information has been valuable in, in setting at least my school district or our school districts up for success in this region. And so I can't say more, just the level of communication and the level of my anxiety dropped when we had these other, and then this is an example of, of, of my gratitude of bringing everybody into, in, in with this Q and A moment. And um, Charlie Silva, thank you very much. All of this stuff has been great, um, but I just pointed out just a few names and I'm probably not naming out enough. So my gratitude is there and I'm very grateful um, for, for all of you, for, for everything you do. Thank you. Awesome, and thank you, Rod, and thank you, everybody. I just echo that. You guys are all doing amazing stuff right now, so thank you very much. Um, um, it is well, 11, oh, yep, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Well, this is um, Charlie, and, and I apologize. I know you want to get off the call, but I really encourage people to look at the chat because uh, Bonneville School District, um, I thought that was a great suggestion on um, 
you know, having uh, call-in hours. So there's some really good suggestions in the chat, and I just don't want folks to, to miss out on all those. So um, just wanted to point that out. Yeah, and I was going to say it's 11.03 as a time check for those of you who have other commitments. I'm committed to stay till 11.30 if we need to, to go through and answer these. I'm not sure that everybody else can, but I'll keep going through those. And to Charlie's point, if everybody takes a second and looks down at the chat, if you notice, there's the area where you can type your message. And then if you look over to the right, there's a button that says file, and then a button that has three little dots. If you click on the button with the three little dots, you can actually save the chat and it'll save it to a file on your computer that you could open up and look at later. So if you wanna save any of the links or anything that's been set in the chat, again, click those three little dots and download that and you'll be able to grab it. Uh, so our next question, um, I'm doing a Google cl uh, Classroom, I guess this is more of a comment. I'm doing a Google Classroom. I made an individual classroom for all of the kids so that they don't see each other and the parents don't see them either. They have their own class code numbers. So great suggestion. Uh, next one, I'm going to be sending home some of the activities I do at school with videos on how to present it to students. Great suggestion. Um, we're looking at sending resources, manipulatives home with contact directions on how families can help and support. Uh, Clayton, a general online thing here. While virtual meetings are great, so is one-on-one -on -one support. Believe it or not, short teacher video, short teacher made videos can be an excellent tool. Plus, you can embed these directly into an assignment or add them to Google Classroom. This will help with asynchronous, meaning students can see them when they need to. Great share. We will be relying on caregivers to help provide online instruction to our students with more significant needs. Um, what about providing task boxes as appropriate? And then if the tech is available in home, uh, you could observe the work routinely. It's not perfect, but you could at least monitor it. Plus it would help uh, families have tasks for their students to work on. And it's still work on IEP goals. Um, thank you, Charlie. I never put a, our severe and profound students in small groups. I think we video clip for students. Agree with Charlie. For the online serve and profound, severe and profound, I've seen several districts not in Idaho provide instructions on how to do task box with common supplies online. Uh, next one for Sphere and Profound, it might just be the teacher taking the time to do a hangout with the family and have the teacher read a story to the students, just face-to-face -face time with the teacher might be best for those students. For IEPs, should we be amending these to adjust how service is being delivered as well as adjustments of minutes during time? Feels like a Charlie this, question. Oh, this go is ahead, Mont. Uh, Charlie addressed that yesterday in her webinar. Um, and a written notice uh, indicating the changes that'll occur, documentation. Uh, if the parents decline that, uh, absolutely document that. Um, uh, you can do uh, an amendment uh, to an IEP uh, through a Zoom meeting uh, or just by phone call to individuals. Uh, and as long as uh, they concur, then there's no need for a meeting to amend. But there's a variety of ways to document the, the temporary changes that are going to have to occur. Very well done, Mont. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm skimming through the chat in the interest of time and just looking for questions. Um, sorry if I missed your question. I'm just looking for those um, and then everybody else can read through for the comments and suggestions. Um, will you please save the chat for us to reread later? Uh, yes. Um, somebody dumped in some access files. Um, Joy, would you be able to unmute, maybe explain those access files you dumped in? Or raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, no offense to Joy, um, but just from a former tech director lens, database files are really vulnerable to viruses. So um, not knowing what are in those, I would be very, very hesitant to download and open those. Um, in fact, most email programs by default just block database files from being emailed because they can contain so many dangers. So without Joy's kind of explanation of those, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody click on those. Uh, sorry, Joy, if you're still here. Uh, 
Oh, and then you can see right below the comment that you need permission to download the files. Zoom might also be blocking those again because of the, the risk of those types of files. Um, next comment was on Flipgrid for phones is a great student app. So I think I've hit the bottom of the chat window. Um, so I will pause for a second to see if anybody has any more questions um, from raising the hand or anything like that. And then I'm going to jump back into my initial start of this, showing you our resources again for anybody who missed it and to make sure it's on the video. And then I succeed. I was able to get the chat the video recording about halfway through yours. So if you wanted to redo yours, especially now that everybody has audio, um, you could also add that onto the end so everybody hears it. So I don't see another question popping up, so I'm gonna jump right into that. So I have shared in the chat a link to our eDay services overview. This is a Google Doc that contains everything that IDLA is doing right now. This is a work working doc. So as we add services, we're adding to this document. So it's a great one to have um, bookmarked to come back and review later. But I do want to point out a couple of things on that. One is our eDay website, which you can see linked here. Our eDay website has on it um, all of the list of all of our webinars. It has the ability to sign up for IDLA's content, which we are making available free to all districts. It's basically our version of a textbook um, that you can grab and use. The majority of our stuff is there, except for a few things like dual credit, um, which some of the colleges own content to AP for a similar reason, and a couple of courses that have some licensed content. Also from this page, a teacher can request live support, which would drop you into a support with one of our live staff members who can help answer questions, walk you through how to use different services, um, or take down your question and get somebody who can answer it. A big part on this is we are making all of our online content available. Again, so um, just to point out for this group, our online content has accessibility features built in like screen readers, alt tags for images, audio and video transcripts, closed captioning, alternative activities for students who can't use keyboards and so on are built right into our courses. So to give you an example of how our courses work, once you request the content, you will get an email that has a link to a list of all of our courses. It's just a Google Doc with each one of our course names. You can click on the course name in the Google Doc and it'll open another Google Doc that has each lesson that's part of that course. You can go through and find the actual lesson that you want to use. You can click on it and it'll drop you right into Course Arc where our lessons are held. You can then click on the part of the lesson that the student wants to see or you wanna see. You can see this one has some of our built-in tools up here for accessibility. Um, you can move through the lesson over on the side. Our video would have trans, uh, could also be transcripted. You can see that down below. Um, or you can also have closed captioning on. All of that is built in to our courses. All the teacher would have to do to use these is copy the link. They could paste the link into an email. They could put it into a Google Classroom. They could put it anywhere that um, the students could get access to it and use this course. No cost. They don't have to be an IDLA student. Um, it's free and accessible to anyone. So with that, I will turn it over to I Succeed if you want to kind of repeat your slides now that everybody's got audio. Okay, this is Tammy again. Um, so it's just a little bit of a slide about what we do um, with I Succeed um, as we receive students in and how we um, work through the services for them. So the next slide, we're gonna do this again. Um, so we look at the basic elements, um, what the courses are, students need the accommodations that will go along with those courses and any modification. We set up special education service time. Um, we have IEP creations and updates, which are what you would do in brick and mortar just as well. We follow our dates and adjust those to student needs. Um, we do special education testing, which is done face to face. Um, we have to, find places to do that with students. Next slide. And so our general ed teachers also look at what accommodation students need and they adjust those to those courses that they teach. Um, teachers must email students and parents to let them know about the accommodations that are gonna be there for those courses. Teachers have access to see what those goals um, students are working on and that's set up through our SIS system that we have and we do have essential courses so that if the general ed courses are just too um, tough for students we have those set up for kids if it meets their needs next slide 
Service time, of course, that depends on student needs. Sometimes students meet with their caseworker maybe only 30 minutes a week. Um, sometimes it's 60 minutes a week. Students are encouraged to um, instant message their teacher at different times. Caseworkers create um, calendar events um, for links for students. Um, and often kids um, will contact our caseworker and do a Google Hangout for instant communication. And so our case managers help students with their special ed courses and their general ed courses through those service times. Next one. And I'm not sure if Gail is still online. Caseworkers work with the students and parents pick times that work for them. And then those are placed on a calendar so that students and um, teachers get reminders when the teachers and students meet up for that one-on-one -on -one time. Um, yes, and so we do complete our IEP meetings, eligibility meetings online, and then we work through those, make changes as we need to, and when everything is complete, we send those out for Adobe Sign so that we have signatures on those. Also on our SIS system, parents are able to go in and view IEPs um, and documents at any time. Next one. Yes, in our special ed teaching for all those types of things, we have to set up a time and a place to meet those students. At this time, it's going to be a little bit more difficult um, because of not being able to meet time um, one on one. So we will be working through our written notices and may have to do those um, complete reevaluations at a later time. And we do have people throughout the state. So this looks like some, um, Clayton must have added some additional resources to our slides. And I don't know if Clayton is still here and wants to talk about those. I'm still here, but I don't, I, I, again, I think the IDLA stuff is absolutely fantastic. I just put together some of this other stuff uh, just in case people needed this. But, uh, you know, I just think using communication tools to adjust for this world and do the things that you always do in a different way. That's the key to all this. Thank you. And thank you for repeating um, the presentation. Wanted to make sure we got all of that in the video for everyone. So with that, um, I didn't see any more questions come in. So thank you all for attending. Sorry that we're 15 minutes over. Um, for those who were planning to attend the state superintendent's webinar that was at one o'clock today, that has been rescheduled for noon, just as an awareness factor for everybody on here, um, if you were planning to attend that. Otherwise, thank you all for attending, and we will get this recording up within a day or two so you can rewatch it if you'd like. And remember to save the chat. Thank you. And thank you to all our participants. Sorry, I should have said that. Thank you to iSucceed and all of your staff for being here. Thank you for Charlie Silva attending and thank you for our IDLA personnel for also being here. So thank you everyone. Thank you Will for doing this for everyone.